So I grew up about half an hour from Detroit, Michigan, and this is the sort of thing I used to see on a regular basis. Basically, a lot of developed space, and that's the norm in that area. So imagine my surprise when I came across this report written by somebody visiting Detroit in 1831. Remarking on the landscape, he said, our hosts at Detroit were right in telling us that we need not go far to see woods. For a mile from the town, the road enters the forest and never leaves it. The the forest? Turns out, this is a general example of what Metro Detroit looked like before Europeans showed up. And yeah, I know that's how development works to an extent, things get cut down, but what I didn't realize was how thoroughly workers decimated the state of Michigan starting in about 1865. They were hunting for so-called green gold, and while the story might sound exclusively awful, it also helped set up Detroit to become the Motor City. I started looking into this after a trip to a beautiful nature sanctuary. It's called Estevant Pines, and it's near the end of Michigan's Keweenaw Peninsula. This place includes some of the most incredible trees I've ever seen. Some stretch more than 125 feet to the sky, and although researchers haven't pinned down the exact time frame the oldest trees in this forest started growing, some of them have been dated at more than 300 years old. Today, Estevant Pines represents one of the last groups of old white pine in the state. But it's not because white pine has been, you know, rare in this area. In fact, huge sections of Michigan used to be full of old trees like this and other kinds of pine as well, to the point where people built an economy based on this kind of wood starting in about the 1850s. By this time period, colonizers had officially taken most of the land in the Great Lakes region, and towns and cities around the lakes were growing and expanding. And with bigger towns came a need for lumber. Conveniently, Michigan was dominated by forest, including pine trees. Pine is a type of wood that, I've been told, is easy to work with and generally looks nice, so loggers latched onto it and got to work. On its own, that might not have been such a bad thing. Something I want to make clear here is that logging does not have to be exclusively bad. Like, removing trees from a forest can help prevent overcrowding, allowing more sunlight to reach the ground, and creating space for new trees to grow up. You just have to be thoughtful and knowledgeable about which trees you cut down. But uh, being thoughtful and knowledgeable was uh, not really the goal for most loggers in the mid-1800s. In their quest for trees, loggers started in the Lower Peninsula and worked their way north, and their main priority was consumption. White pine, in particular, was considered so valuable that I've seen sources call it green gold, and teams and companies took whatever they could get. Like, according to one historian, property lines sometimes meant nothing. In some cases, teams were just told to log to the horizon. So if you didn't keep a close eye on the boundaries of your property, you might show up one day and find stumps. It was almost like a wave of activity and destruction swept through the state. As the logger went north, whole towns even sprung up and were filled with workers, only to become ghost towns once the loggers moved on. And it's not like the destruction stopped once the loggers left, either. Pretty reasonably, the people who were left behind, or new people looking to move into the area, were interested in turning this cut-down land into fields for agriculture. And sure, there were a lot of stumps and scraps left behind from the logging that needed to be removed first, but, uh, you know, they could just burn all of that, right? In a way, clearing this debris, plus the general just dry scrappiness of the land after the logging rush, created an ecological crisis in and of itself. For some 60 years, enormous fires were just disturbingly common. And fire being fire, it didn't just consume the logging scraps. It also consumed homes and buildings, countless lives, and some 73 billion board feet of timber that hadn't been logged. According to one estimate, for every two trees that were logged, an additional tree was consumed by fire. And eventually, this wave of destruction came to the Upper Peninsula as well. By some accounts, the Upper Peninsula was so heavily forested that the average square mile of land could yield 4 million feet of wood board. So seemingly, there was enough to supply generations with timber. Except you can probably guess where this is going. Only 15 years later, most of this forest in the Upper Peninsula was gone, hauled away by animals in rail cars or floated off down the river. In total, it took about 70 years for the logging rush to end. 70 years to turn this land from a lot of dense forest into a lot of wasteland, most of the original pine and also hardwood forests 
were gone. And then some of the logging industry barons that made fortunes on this kind of work either moved on to other projects or went west to continue logging. Now, all this said, I am not descended from a rich lumber baron, and also I really like forests. So it's easy for me to look at a story like this and think that I have benefited from the logging rush in exactly zero ways. Except that's not true. And whether or not you've ever stepped foot in Michigan, there's a good chance that some part of this logging rush has indirectly benefited your life too. Like, of course, there's the fact that the logging rush, you know, cleared lands that made room for schools and important businesses, and that Michigan timber was used to make structures all around the United States. But even more specifically, if you've ever driven or benefited from a vehicle built by Ford or General Motors, to a degree, you have the logging rush to thank. Like when Henry Ford founded his first company, the Detroit Automobile Company, he did it with the help of a lumber baron named William Murphy, someone who had likely benefited from teams logging to the horizon. That company in particular was short-lived, but Murphy continued to fund some of Ford's work and help him get publicity, which eventually led to the funding of the Henry Ford Company. Which, maybe ironically, Henry Ford did eventually leave, but Murphy stuck around and that company eventually became Cadillac. The modern Ford Motor Company seems to have been started with the help of someone from the coal industry. Although I argue that this connection to the lumber industry really helped set up Ford for success and earned him publicity. Meanwhile, the success of General Motors is also largely due to the lumber industry. In this case, the founder, Durant, was both the grandson of a lumber baron and was also a successful lumber salesman himself. And he eventually came to run Buick, purchased Cadillac and several other car companies and parts manufacturers, and found General Motors in 1908. So this isn't to say that the Detroit auto industry, you know, couldn't have existed without the logging boom. There are other car and parts manufacturers out there. But as I hiked around Estevant Pines, this little slice of what more of Michigan could have looked like, I found myself thinking about how, in a way, we traded forests like this for cars, which has absolutely benefited my life and which has been an interesting thought to wrestle with. Overall, the story reminds me that the world is complicated, and how you interpret history really depends on which perspective you're coming from. But ultimately, what I keep coming back to is this. We can't change what happened in the past, good or bad. But if nothing else, I am grateful that the way people treat forests has changed, even if it's still not perfect. Ultimately, I'll take progress over no change at all. As always, thanks for joining me for the story. The trip I was able to make up to Estevant Pines and the filming I was able to do up there was made possible thanks to the generosity of the folks who support my work on Patreon. So if that's you, thank you so much. Patrons help me do things like go on field shoots, buy niche research books I can't find anywhere else, and also they help make these videos sustainable since this kind of work is part of my full-time job. And if you're interested in learning more about the whole Patreon thing and how to get involved, you can do so at patreon.com slash Thanks again for being here, and I'll see you soon.